In the United States, we throw away approximately 63 million tons of food each year, or enough to fill a college football, football stadium every single day. This while one in eight people struggle with hunger in the US. A large amount of this wasted food is in the form of fresh fruits and vegetables, some of the most nutritious and important food for people trying to nourish their bodies. Feeding America estimates that if we wasted just 15% less food in this country, it would be enough to feed 25 million Americans. Now, hunger and food waste are both big, complicated issues. But what one response to simultaneously address these issues that communities, both rural and urban, have implemented is gleaning, a practice referenced in the Hebrew Bible that dates back to ancient times. Gleaning is the act of recovering excess food from farms, gardens, grocery stores, and other sources for the purpose of donating it to those who may not otherwise have access to it. In 2008, the first formal gleaning network in our region formed, Glean ND. This volunteer network evolved out of the Gleaning Practices Blueprint that was put out by the Casclay Food Commission in 2017. Today, we're excited to hear more about this new network, perspectives from one of the pilot farmers, and how this is benefiting those who need it. Would you please join me in welcoming Janice Tweet from Glean ND, Joe Morkin from Morkin Farm, and Nancy Caraview from the Great Plains Food Bank. for the great introduction on gleaning. Um, so I'm here to talk about Glean ND. So as Megan said, Glean ND grew out of a blueprint that was put forward by the Cass Clay uh, Food Commission. And for those of you who don't know, the Food Commission will periodically put out these blueprints that are intended to provide guidelines for how local jurisdictions can address some different food issues within their communities. And so the gleaning project was chosen to move forward and actually be implemented here in our community because it really gets at their goal of trying to make sure that everybody within our community has access to healthy food options. Glean ND really is a partnership of the Cass Clay Food Partners, Fargo Cass Public Health, NDSU Extension, and the Great Plains Food Bank. Um, I am the gleaning coordinator, but I am supported in my role by a task force of members made up from these organizations. And it's really everyone coming together um, to work on this project that really moves the work forward. Um, so as Megan said, gleaning is not a new concept. It's been done in our community for years and years. And so what Glean ND's purpose is, is really to formalize this process and make it an easier um, situation to get volunteers together. Um, so the Great Plains Food Bank could attest to this as well. But basically what has happened with gleaning in our community in the past is that when a farmer has excess produce that they want to be able to donate, um, they call somewhere like the food bank and let them know that they have produce ready and that they need some help picking it. And so at that point, the food bank or organization would need to start calling volunteers, emailing, trying to find people who are willing to go out and garden or farm, go out to these farms and gardens to help get this produce um, to the bank and pantries. And so Glean ND's purpose is trying to build a network of volunteers who are set and ready to go out when these gleans come up and are committed to actually going out and gleaning. Um, so really just trying to ease that process of connecting the farmers to a base of volunteers. So 2018 was our pilot season. We were very intentional in how we went about structuring both our year and the program itself. And so we worked at what we thought was a very manageable scale, um, working with four local growers here um, and completed six gleans. Through these gleans, we were able to work with a good variety of produce. We had um, sweet corn, apples, um, Swiss chard, uh, green beans, tomatoes, we just had what we thought was a really good variety showing us what it really takes to be out there gleaning these different crops. Um, as you can see, we did um, glean over 7,000 pounds, which translates into just under 6,000 meals that we were able to provide for families and individuals here within our community. So gleaning with us really is a pretty simple process. So what will happen is that a farmer will call us, let us know that they have crops available, and then we'll work with them to set up a date and time for the glean. All that information is then posted to an online calendar that we have on our website. And then, um, so anyone can go on our website, look at that and see when these gleans are happening and see if they work in their schedule. 
We also send out emails to everyone who is a registered volunteer with us, and we post it on Facebook as well, so a few different ways to find out as we have gleans. Um, so you can, if you are interested in gleaning, you just sign up for that glean, and then after that, the next step is just to show up at the glean. You don't need any sort of experience with farming or even gardening um, to come out and glean with us. At all of our gleans last year, we did have the farmers with us, so they were there to provide a tutorial, answer questions about proper technique for um, picking, and we always want to make sure that everyone's comfortable before we get going in the fields, and so you definitely would get that um, hands-on experience and know what you're doing before you get started. Um, so then we glean generally, it's about one to two hours, just depending on what the field looks like, what we're working with. And then all that produce is, of course, donated. For our larger gleans, we do um, work with the food bank to get transportation. They're able to provide trucks. And so those larger gleans, we do take the produce directly to the food bank, and then they work to distribute it to their partners. Uh, for our smaller gleans, I am able to take it directly to the shelters and um, pantries here within the community, and that is really just quite a rewarding part of the process to be able to wrap up the glean that way, to be able to stop at the pantry, talk with volunteers or even clients who are going to receive this produce and then hear the gratitude and see what it really means to them to be getting these donations. Um, so, as I said, we have a Facebook page. We try to keep all of our activities up on that. Um, you can follow along with us there, learn more about what we're doing as we enter into our second year here. Um, we also have a lot of information on our website, and if you ever have questions, if you're trying to figure out how you could get more involved with Glean ND, I'm always happy to answer questions. You can reach out by email or grab me anytime as well. Uh, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Morgan. <coughs> Thank you, Janice. And uh, as she said, I'm Joe Morkin. I'm the farmer on the panel this morning. Uh, I farm with my wife and my parents north of Castleton. And we are a modern day commercial farm. Currently, we grow soybeans, sugar beets, and corn. In the past, we have grown uh, barley, wheat, navy beans, black turtles. So we have grown a, a, a mix, but uh, those three are the ones we're hoping to pay the bills with this year. Um, my wife and I also have two boys, seven and five. Um, they will hopefully, one of them anyways, will be generation four on our farm. So um, on a modern commercial farm, right, we have uh, probably more access to acres and land than, than the, uh, the smaller in-town gardener. And so it's very easy for us uh, when we load up the planter and we're gonna put a few, a little bit of sweet corn is what probably starts it for us. And to put that in, you just overproduce, right? You put in 100, 200 feet of corn and it's way more than you can eat and freeze. And even when you call the neighbors and tell the church friends, it, it doesn't all get picked. So there's, there's plenty of waste. Um, and in 17, we had way more tomatoes than we needed for salsa. And so there was waste there as well. And so knowing Megan, if many of you know Megan in another role she has, it's hard to say no when Megan asks you something. <laughs> and so in this other role, um, Glean, Glean was started. And uh, so she was asking about that. And I said, well, we always have waste in our sweet corn patch. So why don't we see what we can do, do for that? And so that's what started us, our involvement in Glean ND. And uh, it worked out very well. Um, at the beginning of the pick, it was, it was just myself and the, and the Glean volunteers. And before the day was done, the rest of the family was off at some different things. They joined, a neighbor joined. And um, so what we really enjoyed about uh, the, being involved in the glean is it was very easy for us um, from the farm side. And there's a lot of misconceptions today. Um, not everything you read on the internet or social media is true. And so by being involved in glean and, and the volunteers coming out, you know, we're able to work side by side with them and uh, answer any questions they have and maybe take some of the uh, scariness away from from modern agriculture because there isn't anything we do uh, to our crops that that is going to harm you it doesn't hurt our our family and um, and so it's it was just a very natural and easy fit for us um, to be part of this program and we we enjoyed it very much so um, that's kind of all I have I guess for now until the till the Q&A. So um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Nancy.
So we know at the Great Plains Food Bank that the work we do is done better when we have community partners to support us in doing it. We know that we're going to have a broader reach and a um, larger impact when we have those partners. And so Glean and D was a perfect example of that for us. It's a way of having organizations that are coming together, working together to create a platform that's going to bring in our growers that will support us throughout the year, and then also volunteers that we always that we can lean on to support us in these gleans. Um, prior to Glean and D, Jan has kind of alluded to it before. To I would spend time every single summer around the harvest season calling volunteers, hours and hours of calling volunteers to say, calling them phone trees, um, doing emails, trying to get people to come out to the fields and help us glean. And sometimes we got 15 to 20 people and it was wonderful. Sometimes it was me, the driver and the farmer picking a field of corn in 90 degree weather. So it would get really, it was hard and it wasn't the most efficient way of doing this. And so when I got approached about Glean ND, I knew it was the most natural and perfect fit because now we have this database of volunteers that are wanting to help us, which all of you will be on too after this, I know it. And then there's the growers that, you know, we have planned growers from the very beginning of the year that are saying, yep, we're gonna do this with you. We know ex what they're gonna plant for us and we can get that on a calendar. And then those volunteers are able to sign up on that calendar and say when they wanna get out and glean. And so it's just this perfect mix of being able to be efficient and have a broader reach and have more impact. And for us at the food bank, that impact means that we're able to serve more people. And being able to serve more people means we're able to get more fresh produce to them. Every year at the food bank right now, we're serving about 97,000 North Dakotans. And to those 97,000 North Dakotans, we're serving 13 million meals. And those 13 million meals is about 30% of that is fresh produce. So five or 10 years ago, that 30% wasn't there. We've grown that exponentially over the last five to 10 years. And we know that with Glean ND, we'll be able to continue to grow that. And um, it means a lot to us because we're able to get that fresh, healthy produce to people and they're able to have more variety and more options when they walk into their food pantry. So um, that's always a really great thing for us. And what we find though too is with produce is that as we grow it, people want it. You know, people want fresh produce. When that first pallet of sweet corn comes in the food pantry, it's gone in minutes. You know, in September when that fresh corn comes in there, it might not go so fast because people have been eating sweet corn all summer. <laughs> But then we find things like, you know, there's, there's the produce that they're used to. They're used to tomatoes and they're used to carrots and they're used to onions. But then if something like jicama comes in, eh, it might not go as fast. You might see that sitting on, the, sitting on the shelf a little longer. But what we find is that if you're taking that time and our food pantries are maybe slicing up that jicama and having taste tests of it and our um, clients are able to try it as they're walking through there, that little five-year-old is going to be like, Mom, take some jicama home with us. And they're going to take it. And so... If we take that little extra time and spend doing some of that education, more people are gonna want this fresh produce that we're offering. And it's, it's small changes. It's these small little changes that would eventually make big change over a long period of time. I have another story with that with um, um, Megan. Megan is the, the famous one up on stage here today. Um, so when we, we get squash every single year at the food bank. And by squash, we get like, we have one farmer that does three semi loads of squash for us. Wow. So we get squash. Um, and the thing, and Caroline could attest to this, because she worked at the food bank with me, is that over and over again, we hear people don't like squash. People won't take squash. People don't know how to cook squash. And so it's over and over again. And I wasn't okay with that. I wasn't okay with that being the answer that we were going to fit with. It was, doesn't mean it wasn't true, because there definitely was a lot, it was a harder one to get, um, get out for us. And so my solution to it was when we had a lot of produce that had come in last year and we did a distribution at our food bank, I called up Megan. And I said, hey, Megan, you want to come over and do some squash tasting? So she came over with her crock pot full of squash soup. And there was people standing in line. And instead of, um, you know, they're standing in line mingling while they're waiting to get, get through their, um, to get, pick up their produce, they were trying squash soup. A lot of them probably said they didn't like squash before. A lot of them had never tried squash before. But I guarantee you that after they left that day, they had their squash soup recipe in their hand, and then they had a bag full of squash with them. Mm -hmm. And they were going home, and they were going to try and cook it. And so that's the impact that we're making when we're working together as these organizations, when we're partnering with each other, and when we're making, um, trying things a little bit differently. And so I think that's really important. And those are the types of things that keep me going and keep me doing the work I'm doing because I know that I don't have to forge this path of doing the work I'm trying to do to try to get more fresh produce to the people that need it alone. I have these partners 
like that work together on Glean ND. And I think Glean ND is that perfect example of that. And we're gonna be able to keep making huge impact. And so instead of me, just as the Great Plains Food Bank and what I was doing, working to get more produce out there, we were all able to do it together. And so the other great part of this is that you all get to be a part of this too. Um, so we want you to get out in the fields. We want you to get to know your farmers. When we were out at Joe's farm, it was incredible. It was the hottest day of the summer. I will tell you that last year for those of you that were out there with us. But like Joe said, a farmer, all the, it was started with about uh, 10 of us or so, and then all of a sudden all the neighbors were out there. Anyone that drove by stopped and picked sweet corn that day. And so it was really incredible to see that. And what you'll learn about those farmers is that those farmers are the most generous people in the world. Not only are they working sun up to sundown to try and put food on their own family's table, but they're taking that time to also give back to their community at large and trying to get food so that every North Dakotan has fresh produce on their table. And that's really impactful for me. And so I just really encourage all of you to go out and find your part in this. And whether that's going out in the fields and picking produce, which I highly recommend, or if that's volunteering your time at a food pantry to do some squash tasting or to slice up some new produce that you know that's gonna be there that you're donating and just uh, work to find your place in this, uh, in our community to help get more fresh produce to everyone. Thank you. Woo! Awesome, thank you guys so much. I'm gonna scooch over a little bit so I'm not often. All right, and per usual, Annie, I forgot my watch. So can you give me a, a cue when I need to wrap this up? Thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you guys so much for sharing that fabulous information about Glean ND. Um, so now is the portion of our program where we get to ask these fine folks some questions. So um, from what they shared today, if there's anything you want to know more about Glean ND, and then we also want to use this time to share ideas as well. Last year was the pilot season for Glean ND. It's a brand new program in our community. So if you thought of something that you thought might be a great addition for this program or a new partnership, um, we want to hear about it. So um, just raise your hand and I'll um, go ahead and call on you. Yeah, Jen. Um, so what kind of a uh, parameter do you guys see yourselves serving? Just the FM area? Or are you, you know, planning to expand? You know, Nancy, I know a little bit about the food bank. You know, how far out do you guys reach, or do you just stay in the FM area? I can answer that one. Um, so that's a great question. So we started this last year as a pilot in Cass Clay, the Cass and Clay counties. And then this year, we're actually gonna be able to expand it a little bit to more um, outside that Cass Clay area to um, get some more farmers on board with us there. And we will continue as the Great Plains Food Bank to do what we do and glean produce in other parts of the communities until we're able to expand this actual network statewide. Um, that takes the, some funding and some manpower to do that. And um, right, we've been really lucky to have some funding to keep Janice on part-time with us to do this over the last couple years. And so we're hoping to be able to expand it so that it gets rolled into our everyday operations of just having Glean ND statewide for um, doing um, um, working with all of our partners. Thank you. Yeah, Mara. I had a friend last summer that grew a garden for the first time because they moved into a home, and it, but it was in in town, and but it was a big garden, and she had so much produce. Do you? Uh, also participate in the city if if somebody has a backyard garden and you can can you come and glean those gardens the question is about gleaning at home gardens yeah definitely last year was we were very intentional so we weren't really taking on things like that but um, our hope is to be able to be nimble enough to be able to take on anything like that that comes up um, no matter what the size, that's part of, we would just um, make it a smaller glean, but yes, definitely, we wanna be able to help um, reduce that waste and get that produce into the food bank system. Okay. Yeah. So I'm expanding it past vegetables. Will you be doing fruit trees as well? We see so many trees that, you know, health-wise, you wanna get all the fruit off so that the tree winters without the fruit on it. Will you be greening fruit trees? We've done that with Growing Together Garden, but we couldn't possibly do anything. So the question is about fruit tree gleaning. Yes, we'd love to expand that way too. It just happened that it was a lot of pro or vegetable side of the particular growers that we worked with for the pilot. But yes, definitely expand to fruit. So, and if, any, so if anybody here has a fruit tree that they just cannot mm -hmm. eat all the fruit, they would call who? 
Yes, that would be for me. So um, we did have the email address up there. It's just info at gleannd.org. But if you're on our Facebook page, you can send us a message and there's um, contact information on our website too. But yes, just reach out. Awesome, great. Joe. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we've seen in sort of the food um, ecosystem or arc is, you know, more places to grow in the spring. So hoop houses in order to expand the season, then also storage on the back end. How does the food bank think long term when you talk about pallets or truckloads of squash? I mean, that could last months with proper storage. So what's the opportunity with gleaning and then also the food bank and the facility to have that storage capacity, which we just don't have in the community for good produce? You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, um, it's, it's funny because we partner sometimes with um, all over the state, but the, down in the Standing Rock area, they have like a cellar where they're able to keep mm -hmm. this produce, and it's amazing. I would love to be able to have that. And there are food banks that we partner with that they have multiple coolers with multiple temperature controls mm -hmm. so that they're able to keep this produce long term. We don't currently have that capacity, but we what we do is so, and another thing we get, we get potatoes nine months out of the year. And so we are able to keep those in cooler spaces to, um, to help um, keep it at the temperature it needs to be. And so, I mean, I think it'd be great if we had some sort of cellar space that we could keep squash long-term, but when we get onions and potatoes year round, um, it's just a matter of being able to work with partners that are able to store it until we can take it on. You know, we can't take on five semi-loads of potatoes at a time, but um, we're able to take on one semi-load of potato mm -hmm. at a time and get that out to the state. Um, so we don't long-term, we're, we're in the process of building another freezer at our food bank because we are out of capacity there. Um, I think it'd be amazing to be able to have more funding to be able to build another cooler that can be kept because right now all of our cooler space is for everything we keep in a cooler, whether that's dairy or produce or um, deli or anything perishable that's cooler is in one cooler at one temperature and produce is not supposed to be kept all at the same temperature. Um, so in a perfect world, we would have temperature controlled. Um, a food bank in Minneapolis is currently building temperature controlled loading docks and five different coolers with different temperatures and it's dreamy. It's really dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't often hear people talk about dreamy cooler space, so that's great. Um, can you expand a little bit more because I know we had a conversation in September about hunger and kind of explaining how this charitable feeding system works that the food bank is kind of the warehouse for the large quantities of food and then this gets sent out into the food pantries and how you're working to increase the capacity of the pantries to be able to handle this fresh produce too. It's a great segue, Megan, because that's both of my roles combined. So my role used to be at the food bank of bringing in this fresh produce and working with our growers all over the state um, to bring this in. And so we do, um, we do, we are able to, so we're part of a network of food banks, uh, Feeding America, which is the national network of food banks. There's over 200 food banks throughout the entire country. And a great thing is, so we are in Potato Central here, you know, in the Red River Valley. So we have access to semi-loads and semi-loads and millions and millions of pounds of potatoes. And what we help do is we help, um, we take what we can statewide here and put, um, move it along to, through our food pantries. But then what we can't access statewide, we help move nationally to other food banks around the country. And then those food banks in Florida send us oranges in January or um, things like that. So it's a really great network to be a part of. Um, but one thing that we're being really mindful about in these next few years is how do we keep more of that fresh produce, those potatoes and onions that we have year round right here in North Dakota. Um, so that is involving capacity building with our, um, our food pantries. And so a lot of our food pantries are run by volunteers. They're in very rural communities that don't have um, refrigeration. They are open once or twice a month because the size and the nature of being run by volunteers. Um, and so our goal is to work with those partners of either one, can we help them build capacity and be open a little bit more, get some refrigeration, find some more volunteers, get the community to support them. I mean, that's key is to get more community members to support the work they're doing. And if we can't get to that, what we do is we um, invest our manpower into doing that. And we'll bring a truckload of produce to, um, we were just up in Mayville yes, a couple days ago, bringing fresh produce. We bring an entire semi load of fresh produce up there to them and other perishable items to distribute out. So where we can't help them build capacity because if they um, just don't have that within them, we um, work to help support that community. So until we can help build that up. And what we can do is we can show the need is there. You know, if we bring a truckload of produce out to them and it gets gone, we can show that community that there is a need in your community and let's help figure out a way that we can um, make a pantry and build up the capacity of that pantry. Thank you. Yeah, back corner.
Are you saying, yeah, so like freezer meals are like pre-made. Um, so we don't partner specifically with anyone that does that right now. I think it's great. I mean, anything that comes down to um, processing and storing food and making it so that's user friendly later. I mean, we have dreams of even taking some of our potatoes that um, we can't utilize up right away and making them, you know, de dehydrated potatoes. So then we at least have things like that or to take um, sweet corn and can that or to preserve that because we have so much sweet corn. We don't currently have that um, capacity, but I think it's an amazing idea of someone to be able to um, do some sort of meal type of prep thing like that. So Joe, and then I know we have, an, Bjorn was also one of our pilot farmers from the 2018 season. So from a grower's perspective, what's the motivation for participating in something like Glean ND? Because I mean, in some cases it actually is extra food, but in some you're making the conscious decision to grow this extra food for donation and you're giving up a Sunday and pulling your family out, driving your skidster and <laughs> um, doing a whole bunch of work for, what's the motivation there? I think uh, a couple things. Um, one, as you alluded to in, at the beginning, the food waste, we want to um, help eliminate that food waste. Uh, if we're gonna go through the work and expense of growing it, let's, let's not let the critters eat it all. Let's uh, get it to the people that need it. And then also just uh, good of the community. We have a food bank in Castleton uh, for rural Cass County. And so you, us personally, we see that a lot. And, and uh, so to make that effort, uh, and you know some families that probably use it and, and need it. And so you're making that you're making that conscious effort to, to try to grow something. Now, last year, of course, we tried to grow extra tomatoes for you and it didn't work, but um, <laughs> maybe it'll rain more this year. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <clears throat> um, yeah, Mike. Yeah, so the question is related to um, processing this excess produce and does it need to be done in a commercial kitchen in order to make its way into food pantries, the food bank, um, that, that barrier? Yeah, so we, um, that's a great question, Mike. And um, when we're taking product into the food bank and through our, our food pantries that we partner with, there does, because of food safety, have to be done in a commercial kitchen. Um, and have be labeled so that we know that what the food is and what's in it for allergy reasons, all the different um, regulations that we have on us as being a food bank and being uh, monitored. But that's not to say that, you know, if someone was to go make applesauce and th that they couldn't share it with their community at large or through, you know, through the churches or some uh, another place, but we can work together on what that looks like to make sure that it's being done in a commercial kitchen and all the regulations, we can talk through those. And we've, we've worked with Extension a little bit on what that looks like. Um, and how, how something that would work, uh, how, how that would look. We just haven't had the manpower on our staff to do that in the past, but I would highly recommend someone if they wanted to take on some, doing something like that to reach out to us and we'd love to have a deeper conversation about what that would look like. Joe, did you have a comment? Yeah, um, so along those lines, uh, I think it'd have to be something that would have to run through Janus, but uh, the North Dakota Department of Ag have a commercial um, food wagon uh, partially sponsored by the Soybean Council and that is available for use on things like this. So it would be, it would be something where if, if a gleaning project picked a bunch of apples and you picked a weekend to make a bunch of applesauce, you would have to get that trailer brought in and, uh, and then you can make it in a commercial kitchen. That's exactly what it's used for, so. Yeah. Fun story, I uh, started my first job in 2010 in Bismarck. The second day we harvested a thousand um, years of sweet corn and then the next two days I sat in that unit and processed sweet corn so that was a great introduction to my job. Um, Bart. We, we've actually looked into that um, and as long as you're not selling the item at your church it doesn't have to be produced in a commercial kitchen so you guys could hand them out um, there is a commercial kitchen downtown um, that people can rent um, for processing um, so if you wanted to make it official and process something in a commercial kitchen to give it away just to appear better, but at your church, you could absolutely, there's nothing against it legally to make the applesauce and give it out as like a food pantry at your church or give it to a community organization to hand out, maybe not the food pantry, but there are ways to do that and it's absolutely legal. You just can't sell the product. If it's prepared in a commercial kitchen, you can then sell it. But if you're giving it away to people that need it, 
please do that. And if you need a commercial kitchen, there's one to rent down there. And I'll also add that if anyone's considering doing that, um, NDSU Extension has a whole bunch of resources about the proper techniques for doing that type of canning. So um, check that out for, for those resources. Deb. I also know that Kitchen in Moorhead, um, Christ the King Church has a commercial kitchen and they have allowed fundraisers held there and such, you know, other things like that where they, a commercial kitchen is needed. Um, but I look at not just applesauce, but just sliced apples that could be frozen or um, berries that are just frozen on, on sheets and put into bags. Um, it doesn't involve all the cutting and all the adding of other items still need um, the cleanliness involved, but that would be a lot easier process than actually making a final product. Rita. So this is for Joe. How do you get your neighbors to do this? <laughs> so we have all our producers in Cass County throw this up before us. He gives them beer afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> there was beer involved, yeah. Uh, you know, I think it was... No, I mean, that they use the lab and grow some more corn for us or tomatoes or... I think it's just to get the word out, and I, I don't know the good way to to get the word out. Um, I think a lot of producers are similar to us. You know, they use their planter to put the sweet corn in, so you always have overrun. And there's a lot of donations that are given to the Cass County Rural Food Pantry, which they get overrun with sweet corn. So that why that's why this was a good fit uh, with Glean and going into Fargo. I believe you moved it all over the state, ours this year, um, but. It's, it's to, I guess it'd be for Janice to have that list in, you know, do you need more tomatoes? Potatoes aren't the issue. I know you're working on uh, navy beans and stuff like that. Um, but what do you need more of of the garden type produce? And, and this, I, I don't know the best way to reach the farmers, but um, it would be, I think it would be feasible. Uh, people would be willing to put more in. Yep. Yeah, make it. That's awesome idea. <laughs> Within the scope of the work we've done so far, we have not talked about that, but we will definitely be talking about it at our next task force meeting and seeing um, what it would take to be able to expand in that way. And just to go off of that a little bit, I think that in our first season, we realized that um, this processing for extending the shelf life of this food is essential because we did hear some stories about we went to all the work of recruiting the farmers, sending the volunteers out into the field, harvesting it, bringing it to the location, and then it ended up getting thrown in the trash a couple days later because they didn't know what to do with it or they didn't have the time to use it in the, in the shelf life of that food. So, um, and knowing that certain foods are very perishable like the tomatoes or the greens or those things. So, um, yeah, I think that's a great conversation to keep exploring. Ashley. Combining gleaning and foraging. It is not something that has come up yet, but it's another thing that we can add to the list as we think about different ways to try to reduce that waste while also getting it to the food pantries. Yeah, it was interesting in that first year, like thinking about how to, because the question about going into someone's home garden, doing the fruit trees, it can become a very large number of places that you could be potentially sending volunteers and the logistics of all that, and um, but things to keep in mind. Um, yeah, Jen. You had mentioned that you had, in the pilot program this past year, you had farmers who intentionally grew additional um, produce to be picked. How about for those of us producers that, for me example, I had over 700 pepper plants this past year. 
And as many of you know, we went from summer to winter in the matter of a week in the beginning of October. So I was out frantically trying to pick all these peppers. If I know, you know, if I could see that coming up a couple days in advance, what kind of a time frame do you see that if I can, you know, contact you and say, hey, winter's on its way, I've got all these peppers in my garden, I don't want to see them go to waste. Can you get, do you see yourself being able to get a group of volunteers together in a matter of a couple of days and getting out there and doing that? Yes, so that is one of the goals to be able to be able to act quickly like that because we realize, I mean, in the ideal world, we have a week notice where we can really try to pull a good group together. Uh, but we realize that especially as we get to the end of the season, it's gonna be a uh, very short notice that we get. But yes, that um, we definitely wanna be big enough and nimble enough to be able to take those on as much as we can um, and get that out. So I think with that, because I think that's absolutely true to be able to, we want to be able to access as much as we can and act quickly. So with that, we need more volunteers. We need more people to sign up and be willing to do it because we did have people that signed up on the roster to be volunteers, but never actually signed up for a glean. So that's what we would encourage people doing is actually get out and do it and sign up with it. Because we can't do, we can only do what we can with those of us that are on the task force and things like that. We need more people that are willing to come out and help us. Um, yeah. In addition to the, the local food pantries, how does the Great Plains um, Food Pantry distribute food to other sectors, or is it just the food pantries, or how do they get the food out to the people that need it? Um, so we are a statewide organization, so many states have multiple food banks. We serve the entire state and Clay County. Um, and so what we do is we have our network of food pantries that, um, so we have over 200 food pantries and we work to um, distribute food to them on a monthly basis. They are able to order perishable and non-perishable food items from us that we truck out. We have a fleet of um, four semi-trailers that truck food around our state for us. Um, and then if we can't get it out through our food pantry partners, what we do is we bring out our truck to communities and actually distribute off of our truck. And we use volunteer forces for that as well. We'll bring you know 20 volunteers to help us do a um, whether it's a mobile food pantry where there's boxes of dry goods plus perishable items, or if it's perishable food that we just bring out, and um, um, whether that's you know from meat to dairy to produce all being distributed out. So we're really efficient in the way we are able to bring food in and then quickly get it out. Um, we had a lot of pr fresh produce that had recently come in. And um, within a few days, we were able to plan an entire route to the southwest corner of North Dakota to make, to distribute about 40,000 pounds of food because we needed to get, they needed food and we needed to get it out. And so um, we have a, it's, it's really what food banking ends up being a lot of times is a very like logistical distribution game is what we do. It's um, bringing food in and getting it out really quickly. Did you have a question as well? Yeah, I think that's a great um, comment and question to bring up just food access for all, but making sure that everyone has equal access to food they need to be to sustain and that you can't always, you know, we know that there's a challenge of not having um, always the adequate hours and locations for people to access these services, whether it's a food pantry or soup kitchen. Um, so I think that there's a, that's a really big, robust conversation that needs to be had of how do we make sure we're reaching that community. And we're starting those conversations, um, having them internally, <clears throat> excuse me, and having them with other community partners as well. But um, we haven't done any specific work on processing food or making sure. But I think that, you know, there's the homeless coalition that's, uh, they probably work really well on trying to get more food out and have their food. And we partner with them. And so there could be opportunities for deeper conversations on what that looks like. Well, I know there's the community, so the, yeah, like, I heard somebody speak about mm -hmm. cafe, so yeah, so we have Heart and Soul Community Cafe, which is amazing and does great work, and they do at least monthly meals, if not sometimes more, I think, um, so, and I think their goal is to expand that if they have, it's, 
it's their volunteer base as well. So when you're volunteer base, you can, you know, they're working full-time jobs too. So to be able to get that one more volunteers to support and then how would that look to be, uh, um, I think that they, I, I could be speaking for them, but a goal would be to have brick and, you know, to be able to have a space that could be open more often and do that. Um, so it's, but they've grown in, incredible amount over just the few years that they've been here. So that's, uh, I think a win for our community. And I think Leola had to leave, but there are cards for Heart and Soul Community Cafe on the table in the lobby. And yes, she shared it. Um, they spoke at one of our previous First Fridays that they ideally would love to have a permanent um, location. Um, so we are down to our final question. So how we end all of our First Fridays. I know you guys have shared some ideas already, but what can this community do to support you? How can we move Glean and D forward and continue the good work you guys started in 2018 to make it something long-term and successful in the future? Um, so I guess my comment would be, um, is because there's so many great ideas that I heard come out of the questions here, is that I would encourage everyone to get involved in some way. So whatever your skill level is, um, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, I'd love for you to go out in the field to meet your farmers, because that's been one of my favorite parts of working at the food bank. But um, if it's not that, then get it. Then find your niche and what you can do to help support. If that's going to a food pantry and working to help um, do some taste testing of fresh produce or different things like that, and um, like Megan was talking about her, you know, ability to potentially do processing. So just find your way that you can get involved in helping to get make that fresh food and um, healthy foods ac equ um, accessible for all that need it too. So. Um, I would add on to that, that I would invite everyone here to come out and glean with us this summer and into early fall. Um, it really is a really fun experience and um, a great way to get outside. You can bring your friends and family, you know, come out and meet new people and you're giving back to the community as well. And as Nancy said, it's really going to take building our volunteer capacity for us to be able to take on these larger issues and really um, start to get at solving our um, food problems here in the community more so. So the first step, though, I see is coming out and just gleaning with us at first. Uh, I'm probably not going to add much new. Um, just like they said, there's a lot of people in our communities in need, and, and we all have different specialties that maybe we're good at. And I think just to find our place, uh, whether it is to come out and pick and glean or whether it's uh, the new idea of, of storing, you know where where can where can we help and um, but me personally, yeah, uh, volunteer. If Janice is going to keep picking the hottest day of the summer to pick sweet corn, we need more people. <laughs> awesome. Would you guys all please join me in giving these fabulous presenters a round of applause?